Welcome back to the next episode in this short series. Uh, throughout this series, we've talked about different aspects of academic writing. We've talked about grammar, structure, and content. Uh, as I've tried to emphasize earlier, they are all necessary to good writing. Uh, neither one of these aspects is indispensable. It's a little like a camera tripod. Uh, if something is missing, the whole thing is going to topple. You might have a paper that is grammatically correct with clear, correct sentences, with a very fluid, lucid structure and arrangement of ideas, about a paper with a ridiculous subject, or with a paper lacking any kind of concrete or logical support to the arguments. Uh, the entire thing is going to be worthless, even if those other aspects of your writing are present. Today I'd like to talk more particularly about content, and content in relation to support. Most academic writing is supporting a position. There are other types of writing that deal with uh, informing the reader, uh, reporting, uh, personal essays. Most academic writing is going to deal with an argument that you are trying to prove in order to convince the reader of your position. Uh, rhetoric is really what I'm talking about in this episode. Rhetoric. Uh, how are you supporting your arguments? And really, one of the fathers of rhetoric is Aristotle. And even 23 centuries later, composition scholars owe a great deal to Aristotle, who set a lot of the ground rules and the theories for ideas about argumentation. Aristotle is the father of many branches of science. He's a very important scholar. Uh, but what I want to talk to more specifically is rhetoric. I did a graduate course once in rhetoric, and we never really agreed at the end what rhetoric even was. But I would simply define it as the art of persuasion, uh, the art of convincing an audience to accept your position. Aristotle was chiefly talking about spoken rhetoric, the art of speech. Now, I keep emphasizing that making a speech and writing a paper are different things and call for different techniques, but in this case, a lot of what Aristotle was talking about with making a correct speech also applies to making good writing. And I'd like to use three of his principles because I'm just a three kind of guy and it works well with academic writing. Uh, the three things that uh, Aristotle emphasized as the components of an effective persuasive speech are logos, pathos, and ethos. They may not be using the correct pronunciations. Uh, these are Greek terms. They relate to three components of rhetoric. Well, what do we mean by those? The first is logos. What does that sound like? Logic. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, does your argument make logical sense? Does it add together in concrete principles that do not conflict and that clearly support a conclusion, uh, however you frame it. Uh, for the Greeks, a favorite device was the syllogism. You have one principle, a related principle, and you derive a conclusion based on that principle. Or, or only people wear glasses. Uh, the, Fred is wearing glasses, therefore Fred is a person. Uh, that's a logical conclusion based on these premises. Logic can be abused. Uh, what if I said, well, uh, Mary doesn't, uh, uh, only people wear glasses, Mary is not wearing glasses, therefore Mary is not a person. That would be faulty and flawed logic. So the benefit of a logical argument, a logos argument, is that if it's correct, it's rock solid, it's difficult to refute, it's a fairly straightforward paper to write because you're dealing with principles that function very much like mathematical truisms. They're true and they're relatively indisputable. Uh, the problem with the Logos argument is that if you have flawed logic, uh, the entire thing is going to fall down. Or, if you have a logical argument that contradicts itself, 
You begin your paper by saying uh, police officers should carry guns. Later on, you decide police officers should not carry guns. Uh, your logos argument can collapse through contradiction. I don't think we need to spend much more time on a logos argument because it's fairly self-evident. Your argument must make sense. It must be logically supportable. Uh, moving beyond that, let's talk about pathos. Uh, that doesn't sound like a very nice word. It sounds like pathogen, or it sounds like pathetic. Now, pathetic is, is the modern usage of pathos, or the modern derivation. Um, usually it's accompanied by disgust or disappointment. You've come to my class ten times in a row drunk. That's pathetic. Um, a politician steals some money from someone who's vulnerable, that's pathetic. It's disgusting, it's immoral. Uh, in the original sense here, pathos is referring to emotion, but uh, simply what Aristotle was talking about was using emotions to sway an audience, using emotions to make the audience agree with you. Uh, okay, well, some famous commercials. There was a public service commercial in the United States in the 70s. Uh, back at the time when the highway system was new, there was still a culture of throwing things out the window. Um, I remember the previous generation, uh, littering was much more socially acceptable than it is now. And one of the reasons were these uh, public service commercials. Now, in the 1970s, if I were to design a commercial encouraging people not to litter, uh, if I could marshal a bunch of statistics, I might convince people in their heads, but not in their hearts. Uh, what if I had a commercial where you have a native Indian with a tear in his eye, watching people throw litter away? Uh, that's immensely effective. Or I'm thinking of the Michelin Tire commercials in the 1990s. Uh, you could have a commercial with a bunch of boring statistics. 63% of studies have shown that at speeds above 79 kilometers an hour, 68% uh, of the time, fatalities or multiple injuries conflict. Be okay, that, that's just an endless list of statistics that no one cares about. Uh, or, because so much is riding on your tires. You have a picture of a baby playing on the tire, and it sways the audience, and it makes them want to buy your tires. And it certainly did work for Michelin. Okay, well, the first objection that some of you are going to raise is that this has the potential for misleading people, of being dishonest, of uh, moving them towards positions in an unfair or a manipula manipulative way. And that's true. Aristotle himself argued, Logos is the purest form of rhetoric. Pathos is kind of dirty. It's something you trot out when you need it, but it's not really a respectable way of making an argument. To him it was a sort of sop to a public that uh, unfortunately requires that sort of spoon feeding. But otherwise Aristotle did not have a lot of respect for, for pathos arguments. If your thesis statement is simply a pathos argument, uh, this country should not, this or this school should not require school uniforms because they will make me cry. Do you want to see me cry? Um, that's a stupid thesis argument, an argument simply based on emotion. Um, drunk driving is a good thing because it's fun, and I like to have fun. Why are you denying me fun in life? Uh, arguments like this really don't go very far. Uh, so using pathos as support for your argument really has limited uses. Having said that, it does have its place. Um, obviously, you don't want to antagonize the reader, so insulting them in your, in your text is one way of uh, blowing a lot of... Is, is a negative way of using a pathos argument. Uh, alternatively, on the opposite side, trying to be befriend the audience, trying to find common ground. Uh, a personal example is a positive use of pathos. If I were to make a paper about student alcoholism, I could, again, I could bring out a bunch of long statistics talking about fatalities, failures, injuries, broken relationships, uh, all sorts of social or academic problems that stem because of uh, 
student alcoholism on college campuses. That's, that could all be very useful and could lend, lend a lot of credibility and gravitas to your paper. But uh, I might say one of my college dormitory roommates had a drinking problem. And that sort of private or personal anecdote is not only relevant, and it's one of the few situations where using I is valid and useful in academic writing, but it also is a, a good use of pathos because it would be a, an emotional appeal to the audience that's not manipulative. I won't speak too much more about pathos because, again, I think it's straightforward. I want to speak about ethos. I've been talking for a few minutes now and I'm just getting to the main point. But uh, ethos is very important. Uh, and by that, uh, most people think ethics. What I mean is the atmosphere of credibility. What is the level of trust, credence, reliability of the writer? When you make an academic paper, uh, your professor might say, look, use clean paper. Use a plain color paper clip, one that doesn't have zebra stripes on it. Um, don't use a funny Comic Sans font. Make your paper look professional. Uh, why is that? It's not simply for a, a rule for the sake of a rule. It's because you want your paper to look professional so that people automatically pick up the paper and have some confidence in what you're saying. You want the reader to be confident in you, to believe that you know what you're talking about. That's part of ethos. Textually, uh, ethos is, again, a sense of respectability, a, a sense of trust in the reader. Um, I use this explanation a lot and, and my freshmen laugh, but if you want to get a girl, send her a love letter. Uh, there's a kind of intimacy in the written text that you don't find in a speech act. And uh, e even though when you're making a speech to someone, you're there and you're in the flesh, uh, you might be speaking to a group of 500 people. It's not terribly personal, but there is a kind of intimacy and a trust and a, a very personal interaction in the written word that you might not find in a speech. You're holding a piece of paper in your hand and you're looking at it face to face. There's a kind of bond between you and the writer. So guys write girls love letters. Uh, text messages just don't work. You can't add perfume to them. Uh, so, uh, Aristotle, I'm sorry, Aristotle was speaking about the speech act making a speech in front of a group of people. Uh, that was his application of ethos. Um, somebody who has gravitas, who has a deep voice, the right elocution, the right speech habits, they're going to be much more persuasive in swaying an audience. We have these expressions in English, uh, the, em the emperor has no clothes. Gold in the pockets of fools is still gold. These are all expressions that uh, argue that something is true no matter who says it. Uh, maybe we need these expressions because in real life that's generally not true. We pay a lot of attention to the perceived credibility of the person who's speaking to us. Let's apply Aristotle's principles to writing. In the next episode we're going to look at the concept of ethos in much greater detail by examining how the author's credibility is built by effective examples, support, and secondary sources. For now, let's review the basics of content in terms of Aristotelian rhetoric. Arguments can rely on support based on logos, an appeal to reason, pathos, an appeal to emotions or justice, or ethos, an appeal to the speaker's credibility. Good thesis statements could incorporate any or all of these lines of argumentation. While some subjects probably gravitate towards a single approach, such as a pathos argument for a paper advocating a social policy, or a logos or ethos argument for a history paper, ideally a solid thesis might have elements of all three in its sub-arguments.